Oh, good. Good. Well, I must say I was enthusiastic about this. I you know, I'm I'm in my uh, I'm in my mid 60s now, and I'm still trying to uh trying to achieve a vision for myself. <laughs> I, it, it's it's a it's a loser. It's it's elusive. There, I was going to say illusory, but it is elusive as as well. Trying to find your true purpose in life, uh, Linton. I've begun running tape. Uh, uh, tell me about yourself first, if if you can, please, Linton. Well, for many years, uh, from a young boy, I've been very interested in how people think and our personalities and why people do what they do. So over the years I've pursued this particular avenue in my life and long story short it led me here to the United States and I started a business about 10-15 years ago It's leadership management and that business I started because I was giving speeches and the topic of my speech at the time was courage, commitment and conviction. And I wrote a little monogram and I handed it out and it did very well. And people from organizations started requesting that I come in and work with their companies to share some of my ideals and my ideas. So for the last 10, 15 years I've done that and I've worked with large companies, some you'll know of and small privately held companies in a myriad of, of avenues, communication, productivity, leadership, management, and the reason that I've, I've continued to do this work is because I found that the one thing that we all need to understand, and I've written about it in my book, is the difference between a hard skill and a soft skill. And that's a differentiation that I've found that many leaders in organizations haven't been able to understand or been able to apply. And also I found in life that people don't understand what that really means. So. That's a little background on me and how I got where I am today and how I began writing this book, Purposeful Vision. Courage, commitment, conviction, hard skills, soft skills. Well, let's begin with the difference between the two skills. Well, when you work with a company, which I've worked with many, they tend to work with people and hire people on their ability to do the job. In other words, if you're a mechanic, the hard skill would be to be able to fix a car, take an engine, put it in, and take it out. Now, that doesn't mean that you have the personality, or what I call the soft skills, to get along with everybody within the organization, and that you have the ability to delegate, or you have the ability to have management skills when you are succession planned. So the soft skill is your personality and how you think and who you are. The hard skill is the ability to do something. And what I've found over the years is it's not always the hard skill that has been a problem in organizations and with people. People can do things. It's the personalities and the way we think that creates the conflicts. Who are we? What are we about? And how do we interrelate and inter interact with other people? And how did we come to be who we are? That's the soft skill. The hard skill you can teach pretty much anyone who has an aptitude for it. I can teach you Word. I can teach you Excel. Many people have that ability, but put them into an environment where they have to use that with other people, that's usually where you get the problem. Well, it's interesting. I've often said that in terms of uh, radio broadcasting, for example, and operating the, what we call the board and the dials and switches, you know, I said, you know, you can teach monkeys to do that. There's something else you, you need to bring to this in order to, in order to be competent, to be successful. To, you, you need both hard skills and soft skills. Yes, you do. And, and the thing about it is it's very hard to measure soft skills because, because people who are working within different organizations, they do an interview or they speak to someone, and the focus has been, can you do this? And they look at the resume, and most people can. They have the hard skill. The difficulty we have in our lives is how do we uncover what people are really about, not just what they present themselves, but what are they really about? And that's the soft skill. Who are you? What are you really about? How do I get to that part of you so I really know what I'm dealing with? And, that, and that's a skill that I've taught over the years that isn't difficult. It's just something that we, we don't always understand how to do. Speaking with Linton Bergson, his book is Purposeful Vision. See your vision, know your purpose. In bold, I have before me, pursue your true purpose in life by listening to the inner voice. That it's there 
It's trying to guide you. Some of us may have lots of inner voices, and I don't mean that tongue-in-cheek. I, I mean that seriously. We, I can listen to myself frequently. Which, which, which one of the stories that I'm telling myself or the visions that I have are the right ones, the true purpose? How do we know? But let me ask you this. I think we've all had this experience. There's something within us all, Eric, that really niggles at us throughout our life. Niggles at us. Niggles at us. It's this. You know, you, you meet people and they say, I wish I had started a bed and breakfast. I wish I had done this. I had wish I had done that. I thought about this many, many, many years ago and it's never left me. Now, the reason that they've thought about it, the reason it's percolated up within them, it's because they feel something. They can, they can see themselves doing that. It's a sense of purpose. It's a sense of why I am here. Where these things come from, we don't always know. But it does stay with us, and it's consistent. The other voices may come and go and may leave us at a time, depending on our experiences. But true purpose stays with us. If we look throughout history, which again, I've written in my book, you look at Gandhi, you look at the great leaders, they had true purpose. It stayed with them. We are emotionally connected to it. We, it doesn't leave us with the fancies of life. It stays with us. And if we don't address it, it begins to bother us. Now, as we get older and we don't address these things, they become more difficult. So I believe that purpose is directly correlated to what stays with you ongoing in that still small voice, and it never leaves you saying, why aren't you doing this? Why aren't you doing this? Why aren't you doing this? And then that leads to depression, anxiety, and happiness, which we bring to the rest of our lives because we're not listening to ourselves, which then takes into another consideration other factors. To listen to yourself, you have to have faith, and you have to be able to listen to your intuition and not your logic, which I've also written about. Yes, yes. Uh, speaking with Linton Bergson, again, his book is Purposeful Vision. See your vision and know your purpose. You... You mentioned courage, commitment, conviction. Correct. Yes, the three facets of consciousness. Well, courage, commitment, and conviction are things I believe you need to have in order to, to make anything happen in your life. You can't do anything unless you have some courage. And you can't make it happen if you're not committed to it, you don't have conviction to it. So I think that when you're connected to a vision, I think that in the state of consciousness, what I talk about in the book, the superconscious mind is a realm. Well, we can give it a different name if we want. God, source, whatever we want to call it. But the superconscious state is where things happen that we don't understand, but we feel we need to act on. Intuition, vision. The intellectual state to bring it into manifestation are the attributes of courage, commitment, and conviction. So you have these different attributes working simultaneously within us because, again, as I've written, we're divine, in my opinion, and we're human. But we have to bring the two together to have an effective meaning in our life here and make our life work. And I think that's where most people have a disconnect. How do I bring these two together? Because we, we understand it and we feel it. We know it, but we don't quite understand what to do about it. And that's a lot what I cover in the book. What do I do about making this happen? What do I do about it? You also describe how your personal culture determines how your dreams and goals are manifested. Yeah, and that's a very, very, very important point. And let me explain to you what I mean by that. Your personal culture is who you surround yourself with. So if you surround yourself with people who are going to support you and who love you and who can say to you, you know, you have the ability to do that. These are people within your personal culture. You have put them there. They're your friends. They're your family. They're your associates. They're the people that you have decided to surround yourself with within your personal culture. Now, if you decide to move forward and create something new in your life, you might want to establish a new personal culture. Meaning, do you want to keep the same people around you who are naysayers? Who the minute that you say, you know, I, I think I can do this, I feel something in myself, and they then say to you, you know what, that's trash, you don't want to do that. Or do you want to change that and say, I need people around me who say, you know what, I had a feeling too, I acted upon it, and here's where I am. So your personal culture is your environment, who you surround yourself with, and you determine that and no one else. Mm -hmm. And 
what are the differences between your actual state and your ideal state? Well, there's two things here. That's a great question. The actual state is where you are now, and the, the ideal state is where you'd like to be. So when I'm in organizations, I can say, where are you now? This is actually where you are now, and where would you like to be? What's the gap? And what do you need to get from A to B? Again, I cover this in the book in more detail. So if I'm here now, and then I want to be here over here, which is ideally where I'd like to, to have my life, what do I need to do to get there? What's the gap? What do I need to str strategically put in place to make that happen? Because I'm not into the hairy-fairy idea of, of things just happen because you have positive thinking. I think you have to have positive expectation, which is different. But you have to act and you have to have a strategy in order to do it. So you have to know where you are and where ideally you'd like to be. Again, the book is Purposeful Vision. See your vision, know your purpose. Linton Bergson is the author, a, a communicator and speaker. Uh, you, it's you know, we, we've heard often, you know, the, the simple phrase, you know, follow your bliss. Some of that here isn't there. I mean, if, if, if we can find ourselves in a blissful state thinking about that ideal place we wish to be in, and it's that niggling, that thing that niggle, has niggled us for years, you know, that, that you might do, there's, uh, there, there should be happiness there. Even in these difficult times, Yes. I would say this to you. Now, I, I've heard that. I think it was Joseph Campbell who said that. Sure. Now, I I'm, have a different take on things sometimes. I, I do believe that, that you follow your bliss. But what is bliss? You have to determine that for yourself. Because we can have these things thrown out to us, terms we've heard people say over the years. And, and what I've found in my own life is that I tend to ask questions, what is bliss? What does that mean? Follow your bliss. Well, bliss is at a state of of divine ecstasy that you get through a meditative process that has, has a whole different realm of being? Or is that something I can attain in my everyday life just by finding my purpose? I think that, that, that Gandhi mentioned this, that purpose can make you happy. I, I believe that. I think that, that bliss is a different state of consciousness. I think it's, it's a completely separate state of being where you're completely in a different place from this dimension and you're able to go there on a regular basis through hard spiritual work. I think that you can bring the information you get from those states into this world and act. And I think all the great leaders have been able to do that. They've had times of introspection, been alone, they've been in those blissful states, and then they brought that information here to act. So I think that it is important to be able to go there. I think it's an important state to be in. I think you come back in the conscious state, which is where we live to, to manifest things, and bring what you got from that state to work here. And as you said, uh, bringing together the what you call the, the, the three facets of our consciousness. You mentioned the conscious just now. That there's the subconscious and this this super conscious. Uh, what you have done uh, with the uh, words fear and luck, uh, Linton, uh, using them as, as uh, you know as acronyms here. Uh, describe them. Fear, false evidence. Yeah, false evidence appearing real. In other words... False evidence appearing real. Yeah. yeah. I mean, fear, let, let me ask you this. At the end of the day, when we think about things um, and fear comes up in, in us, what's causing it? Has it happened yet? Is it going to happen? May it happen? And the reason that we sabotage ourselves is in the what if. And if I tried this, if I fail... Now... Getting back to the subconscious. So that's why I talk about the three states of consciousness. Where did that original thought come from? Where did these feelings of doubt come from? Who put them there? We put them there. It's a tape playing in the subconscious mind. Where did that come from? Can the subconscious mind be reprogrammed? Can we look back and say, my father told me this. My mother told me this. My friends told me this. Again, getting back to personal culture. Is that what I believe now? So this fear that we have is a voice talking to ourselves in our own head. It is your own voice telling you you can't do something. And guess who owns your voice? Yeah. You do. Mm -hmm. So whatever, it's, you're not, it, when, we, when we listen to ourselves in our heads, we don't actually hear our mother's voice in our head. We hear our own voice in our head. So the tape that we're playing, you know, we want to create... Uh, excellence to be a habit and not an act. 
as Aristotle has said, and it's and, and in my book there, is that we want to create habits that we act upon, that we change through what we tell ourselves. Are we really not good enough? That is the, big, the biggest misnomer that we've ever been told or, or fed to believe, what I, what I call the Kool-Aid. We have to start believing in the magic of who we are, not just individually, but collectively. Once we collectively begin to believe in that magic, the alchemy of who we are, we can begin to not just change ourselves. That's where it starts. We will change the world. But that has to start with ourselves and who we know we are, not who we believe we are. And you've taken the word luck, and you, you, you give it uh, some new meaning. Tell, tell us about that. Tell, tell our listeners about that. Living under correct knowledge. Living it's a, under it, correct knowledge. Yeah, it's a, it's, a very, it's a very simple term. It means that I understand, or one would understand, the wisdom of life. That if A equals B, and I do A, it may bring about a result that I don't particularly want. Now, living under correct knowledge. Let's give a, a real tangible example of that. If I want to achieve something, I have to set a goal. If I want to achieve something, I have to have a strategy. If I want to achieve something, I need to surround myself with people who will support me in that. That's living under correct knowledge. And then people will see the end result of you doing these things and say, boy, you're lucky, aren't you? But you know you weren't. You applied the right principles to get where you needed to go. Is that luck? No, that's living under correct knowledge. Because nothing happens overnight. People work towards things, whether it's Apple computers, whatever it is. People work towards things. Steve Jobs worked towards something. It didn't happen overnight. But you have to have a strategy. You have to have a goal. That's living under correct knowledge, knowing what you have to do and how you have to do it to get from A to B. Lyndon, we're swimming in a, you know, amongst, in a sea amongst many, many other people in, in a world that is filled and fraught with, uh, some would say, uh, you know, bringing up fear perhaps, but, you know, many influences that may not be our own. But if we... If we find our true purpose in life, if we are listening to that inner voice, and if we are with, with uh, courage and commitment and, 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 and you know, uh, a conviction working toward being, you know, fulfilling our own vision, will, will it always, uh, can, it, can it be working toward a better world? Will it, will it, by its very nature of being our true selves, be of an aid to others on this planet and the planet and all the creatures on it? Great question. And again, I, I mentioned and touched on this in my book. It depends. And the reason I say it depends. You can use and have a vision for good, and you can use and have a vision for bad. And we've seen both happen in this world. And I think at the end of the day, we'll always have those, those opposites. It's delusion. I think that as long as we have a, a greater amount of people believing and knowing in themselves and doing their personal leadership and wanting to do something good for the greater good of humanity, not for the detriment, we can change the scale. We have to change the balance of the scale. We have to have more people believing and knowing who they are and activating their good, the individual good for the collective good. So in answer to your question, can we change the scale? Yes. If we have more people activating their own inertia and the individuality for a purpose for the greater good of humanity. I'm not, and I'm talking about CEOs. I'm talking about leaders that I have worked with within industry, that we need to understand that the people in the companies are important. It starts where people go to work as well, and the influence that is brought to bear upon them. And all the training that I have done, and the leaders have brought me in, you see the good infiltrate the people, and then they start spreading that around. It really starts with, with, with leadership, Eric. That's what it really starts with. How we lead our children, how we lead our companies, how we lead the country. That inspires people to do, to do greater good. Well, I'm imagining, for example, Linton, in nearby, not far from this community, well, really a part of this community, there, there is a national, multinational company looking at creating an iron ore mine. And I imagine they think, uh, I, let me for, imagine, uh, for a moment imagine that the vision that uh, someone has, the purpose in life that, uh, that the leadership of that organization, that company has, is to, you know, to do what it does and do it well, and that is to extract minerals from the ground. There 
others who are saying, we don't think this is a good idea for our community. My vision or they, another vision is to, to see that land um, growing the green things and the living things that, uh, that reside and that live upon it. How do we know the difference between what is good for all and what may be good for me? Conscience. You know, this is something that we either have developed or we haven't, our own humanity, and it's to do with our hearts. It's to do with the conscience that we have towards each other and the planet. We all have a conscience, and some of us bury it for a dime. Some of us bury it and hurt the planet. Because that's our own individual nature. It's our own personal leadership. So you're dealing with everybody's own personal leadership. You're dealing with their own value system. You're dealing with their own subconscious programming and mind. You know, if I make a million dollars, I'm a great guy and screw everybody else. And you've got those people who are saying, you know, that's not my value system. My conscience is different. And so you have these, di these differentials going on. The question is, at the end of the day, the people in power and the people who make the ultimate decisions, are, are they guided by conscience? Are they going to help do the right thing? That's what we have to look at. And if that's not the case, then they're just going to feed the other people who are doing the wrong thing. And if the iron ore company wants to drill and they get the okay from above that because those people don't have conscience, it will happen. It will happen. The hearts of the leaders have to change. And the, the conscious, the, the consciousness of us all has to change. And we have to have a conscience about what we're doing. We have to begin to understand that change needs to happen within ourselves, with the majority of people who do, and I do think that that will affect the leadership, and I do think that will affect the world. But I, think, I don't think it's going to happen overnight. In answer to, 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 to your question, it's to do with the conscience of the individuals that are involved. Some people care more than others about the planet, about what happens, and some people don't. And we can't change people. They have to change themselves. But we can lead by example. We can be an example of what we would like, and hopefully it will rub off on other people. We've seen that happen throughout history. The book is Purposeful Vision. See your vision, know your purpose. Linton Bergson, thank you very, very much for being with us here today. Thank you, Eric, and I appreciate you having me on your show. Thank you. Linton, it's been a pleasure. Thanks. Thank you. You know, I want to ask you, Eric, um, is there a set date to broadcast this, or how does that work? Well, my, uh, I, I've enjoyed this so much. I think uh, my hope is to have this on Friday, this Friday morning, at about uh, 8.30. Okay. So I'll... I'll 8.30 Central. 8.30 Central. Yeah, failing that, uh, it would be this coming Monday at 8.30. All right. And, um, I have sometimes, sometimes some news events... Uh, you know, that they're more regional and more current, um, you know, well, they must take priority of things that I, um, you know, a, a subject like this. Although I think this is uh, green and universal, and I appreciate it very much. I love the conversation. Thank you. Yeah, me, me too, and, th and thank you, and thank you so much. Uh, you know, I wanted to ask you something else, because um, of of I wanted to find out, can I get a copy of this interview on my I'll website? Be happy, yeah. be happy to, sure. Okay. Um, and... Um, do I have your website? I'm looking here. It's lintonbergson.com. Oh, probably be right here in the book. There's some there. No, it wasn't actually put in the book. Oh, okay, lintonbergson.com. I can send you a... Uh, um, where would you have me send a... I, I can send an MP3. Um, you can send it to my email. And that is... linton at lintonbergson.com. Lintonbergson.com. All lowercase, will that work? Yeah, that'll work fine. Excellent. Well, I'll do that indeed. Thank you. And thank you so much for your time. I truly appreciate it. Oh, it was a pleasure. It was great talking with you. Be well. Thanks. And you. Bye-bye.